Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning and, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. Today, we're delighted to be uh, hosting this important discussion on the current state and future developments in the cross, cross trait relations with Cho Chui Zheng, who's the Deputy Minister of Taiwan's Mainland Affairs Council. Deputy Minister Cho has served in the current position since 2016, which coincides with a really important juncture in Taiwan's relations with the mainland. Over the past five years, Taiwan has come under a sustained campaign of, of coercion, pressure, and attempted intimidation from Beijing that has included the use of political disinformation, cyber attacks, and a growing number of PLA incursions into Taiwan's airspace. But it's perhaps the next five years that will prove crucial uh, as Taiwan attempts to maintain the resiliency of its democratic system, but also attempts to maintain peace in the, in the Taiwan Strait. Next year, of course, we have the 20th Party Congress, which will likely see, or I should say actually undoubtedly see, the third term of uh, Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping, which brings with it important questions and implications for how China's uh, uh, policy on Taiwan might change and how China's foreign policy more generally uh, might adjust or shift. And of course, in 2024, Taiwan will hold its 16th presidential election, which will see uh, President Tsai Ing-wen leave power owing to Taiwan's own term limits on, on that office. But there are few better to help us understand the current state of play and to give guidance on what's next than Deputy Minister Cho, a political scientist by training. He brings a deep understanding of China's political system and the dynamics of Xi Jinping's leadership style to his current position. And we're very grateful that he made time for us this morning in Washington, DC, but critically, uh, very late at night in, in Taiwan. Um, and as I now go to bed at eight o'clock at night, I am very grateful that he has stayed up past what would be my bedtime. So in terms of logistics, I'm uh, going to turn the floor over to Deputy Minister Cho for about 15 or 20 minutes and he will give a keynote address, and then uh, I will return and we will we'll do Q&A um, until we wrap up at 9.15. So very appreciative for everyone joining us this morning. And with that, uh, Deputy Minister Cho, thank you for joining us, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brownshaw, and the online audience join us today. Good morning. I'm deeply honored to take part in this event hosted by the CSIS and with the support of our TACO in Washington. I would like to send to 
uh, due for this opportunity to share my thought on China on cultural relations and how the Taiwan seek to move forward in the face of the intensified pressure from China. Never before have we seen the mentions of the importance of the peace and the stability in the Taiwan Strait at the events such as the, at the least cross-security dialogue, US-Japan, US-EU, and the G7 summit. Why has the peace in the Taiwan Strait become a concern for the Indo-Pacific region and the international community? What was the behind the shift in the cultural relation? How do we expand Beijing intensify pressure campaign against Taiwan? To answer this question, we first need to understand the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, and his regime. Since the founding of the CCP, the governance and the development of China is very depend on the leader policy line and the ruling style. Xi Jinping built his regime upon the two unprecedented extremes. The first is the extremely centralized leadership to achieve concentration of the power structure within the CCP. The other is the extreme, the, the frantic nationalism used to the consolidate the legitimacy of the CCP. Over the year, the C has won and uh, consolidated his political authority through the high centralization of power and the uh, monopoly decision making based on the autocracy and the cross control. Shifting the 30 plus year of the collective leadership to centralized leadership, even to one man rule, Ding Yi Zun. The launch of the expensive anti clutch campaign and the political suppression rooting out the adversary and the opposition, the practice of the forced labor, restric restriction over the religious freedom, as well as censorship over the media and the internet, were all carried out in the name of the national security. Moreover, under the Xi digital totalitarian, Beijing authority used the high-tech surveillance system to monitor and uh, spy on their own citizens. With all this action, the taken and the skillful use of the his historical milestone to feel patriotism and uh, inside the nationalism, she has made China into a true Orwellian state of the modern day. As a combination of the two extremes, centralized leadership and the frantic nationalism. Today, the China is a regime which have never seen before in the human history, not even in the traditional totalitarian area of the Mao Zedong, not only because the concept extreme nationalism did not exist back then, but also because the China comprehensive power nowadays cannot be mentioned in the same breath as during the Mao period. From the events surrounding the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the CCP and the public reaction, we see the new types of the totalitarianism emerge out of China. To some extent, it's a hybrid of the new Nazi and the new Stalinian, such a Jew extreme new totalitarian system no doubt posed a great threat to the international order and the development of the liberal democracy. These are three features that underpin the C new totalitarian regime. First, decision making under Xi and with his small, small inner circle tend to come with the high risk and the cost. Extreme centralization of power, the governance under the Xi has led to the serious misjudgment and the mistake in the decision making, increased the risk of the internal and the external 
uncertainty. In fact, the several events have overshadowed the C seemingly strong leadership. I would like to throw out a few examples here. First, the China militarization of the South China Sea. This caused the strong reaction from the both the Kremlin state and the interest parties such as the US, UK, France, Japan, Australia. Second, the internment camp in Xinjiang used for the repression and the mass surveillance of the Uyghurs. This gave rise to great concern across the international community about the increasing numbers of the reports of the serious human rights violation. Third, the implementation of the Hong Kong National Security Law which destroyed the city's freedom and democracy, endangered his judicial independence, and put the Hong Kong status as one of the leading global financial hubs under threat. The fourth, the C C to expand his the geopolitical influence through the Belo Initiative, which not only resulted in the debt trade diplomacy for the hosting country, but also over expand of his own resource, impeding the China economic development prospect and affecting his people well-being. This but not least, China has become increased comfortable in his effort to export the so-called China model of Chinese solution globally. The CCP totalitarian, ascetic and mentality has led to the Beijing miscalculation of the resilience of the Western world to uphold the rule-based international order. This created a fresh, fresh point due to the China force and the balanced response and the confrontational attitude toward international community called to abide by existing international rule and the end up developing a vicious cycle among the China and the major state. The second feature is the C has reversed the diplomatic strategy and the development trapped by the Deng Xiaoping, high your capacity to buy your time, Tao Guang Yang Hui. He insists adopt a more assertive and aggressive approach driven by the CCP global ambition, rising tension in this beyond and in this region and beyond. China as the members of the international society should have the ensure his de development path integrate smoothly with the rest of the world in the civilized manner and in that with the universal value to see the peaceful coexistence. Unfortunately, under the leadership, the CCP had turned to hegemonic thinking military provocation, and the war, warrior diplomacy. Overly banking on the configuration of the, the East is rising, the West is declining, Dong Shen Xijiang. The hiding depends on the patriotism and the nationalism, and the opening exposing his ambition to dominate war stage on an equal footing with U.S. China see to become the global hegemon and uh, change his existing international order through the Red China infiltration, such as exporting the Belo Initiative along with the other so-called China model. In addition, the CCP is not averse to use the coercive means to force other members of the international society to accept his behavior and assumption, compelling others to either come to here or keep their silent. For Beijing, all these moves serve for one ultimate end goal. That is to push the U.S. out of the Indo-Pacific region to dominate East Asia and to end Taiwan based, based on the CCP own ambition. The third and the last feature is the CCP as a venture for overturning history and that's of the collecting mechanism with the party and the state system bring about the uncertainty and the risk in Asia. Under the two extreme 
new totalitarian system, she, as the Panaman leader, hold a an limit and an undisputable digital making power. Moreover, no individual, no individual in China has the courage to speak against the leadership or defy the CCP. Intellectuals who are supposed to speak and see the truth and are having only one voice, the official line. Now it's because in China, if you dare to speak up or speak against the CCP, you risk facing the danger of the cyber bullying, forced disappearance or illegal intention. See, extreme low man for the country. Rest ambition have turned China into the major power with with our clear succession plan and the less oversight mechanism. With the inner suppression, external aggression, the CCP regime has single handy created a disturbing high risk rigid environment throughout the Asia Pacific. Faced with the threat of the CCP due extreme new totalitarian system, his ambition and his Taiwan, our only path for survival and the de development is to consolidate the Taiwan irreplaceable strategic importance and continue to bolster cooperation with the like-minded country. In this second part of my talk, I would like to share with you the three approaches Taiwan set out to achieve our goal. The first, in terms of the geopolitics, we want to ensure the international community fully acknowledge the strategic importance of Taiwan in defending against the CCP new totalitarian and promoting the freedom, openness, prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Taiwan is at the midpoint, the center of the first island chain. This gives us a natural geo, geo, uh, strategic importance. In the past, Taiwan was the first line of the defense against the Red China expansion. Today, Taiwan is at the front line of the confrontation between the democracy and the CCP new totalitarian and the outward aggression. Taiwan not only maintained the peaceful and the stable status quo across Taiwan trade, but also played a positive role to ensure the peace and the stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Through the deepening cooperation under the Indo-Pacific region framework in the full scale, Taiwan has, has and will be the strong partnership to usher in a free, open, prosperous Indo-Pacific region. Regime. Second, on the economic front, we will continue to strengthen the Taiwan position as the main provider of the key technology in the global semiconductor supply chain. In addition, we want to show world that Taiwan is the best and the most reliable partner as the global supply chain undergo fundamental restructuring. Taiwan technology, experience, and talent in the semiconductor industry sit at the nexus of the global chip management and the development, further enhancing our key position in the global high-tech supply chain, especially those of the semiconductor and the ICT industry, allow the Taiwan to be the crucial and the ind indispensable partner for the US and the other democratic e e economies. This is especially important since the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated global supply chain development across the industry in order to build a greater resilience. Moreover, while Taiwan has been strengthened our own economy, autonomy, and resistance in this time of the global economy uncertainty, we also understand the importance stand together as a reliable partner for the fellow democratic nation. The third and the last approach is to uphold the Taiwan success story of democracy. Seeing that our democratic experience and practice can inspire the people of the China and Hong Kong to pursue their own democracy and freedom. 
Democracy cannot be compatible with the totalitarianism. The free world, the China has to enter a new era of long-term institutional and ideological competition. To safeguard the enduring success of the Taiwan model for democracy, free from the CCP encroachment, is is this is this is the most important indicator and contribution made to the development of democracy globally. Taiwan will continue to deepen its democratic system and realize universal value of the freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law. Taiwan embraced the democracy, respect the universal value, not only made us the role model for our Asian neighbor, but also showed a better path for the all the Chinese people. While China used the nationalism and their self proclaimed the superiority of the so called China model to block and undermine the possible influence of the universal value and the democratic system of the West. But it cannot play the same trick with the Taiwan democracy. As the beacon of democracy, plus our geographical uh, proximity to China, Taiwan democratic experience and achievement can penetrate and inspire the people of the China and the Hong Kong to Hong Kong people to pursue level of democracy, freedom and a better life. Therefore, Taiwan holds an irreplaceable position in the global democracy camp, driven by its one and only dream, true extreme and the new totalitarian system. The CCP show no respect for the democracy or human rights. As he tried to become a hegemon, this has serious challenged the international of the interests of the U.S. and the neighboring country in the Indo-Pacific region, not to mention Taiwan. CCP hegemonic mentality and denial of the existence of the ROC Taiwan marked the historical turning point of the cultural relation. Taiwan will and shall never accept that Beijing use the of the one China principle and the one country, two system model for Taiwan, which downgrade the ROC Taiwan and undermine the, the, the cultural status quo. As a responsible stakeholder in this region, Taiwan has spent no effort in doing all we can to ensure the stability across Taiwan's trade based on the four guiding principles laid out by President Chai, namely peace, parity, democracy, and the dialogue. Our government has one more once expressed our willing to facilitate meaningful dialogue as long as the Beijing Authority are willing to resolve the difference and improve the cultural relation. Maintaining the peace and the stability of the Taiwan trade is joint this responsibility of both sides. Taiwan has always taken our share of the responsibility in doing so. Knowing this is in the interest of and in line with the security concern of all parties in this region, it is the CPCP who need to step up. When the geographical reality gives Taiwan no choice but to stand at the form form of the CCP intensify political suppression, economic inducement, diplomatic offensive, military provocation, and the social infiltration. It is vital that U.S. and, and the international community continue to pay the close attention to the development of the cross trade situations. Respect, recognize, support the democratic Taiwan through the deepening partnership in the very peace is a crucial way for world liberal democracies to join, respond to, and deter the CCP challenge to regional peace. Only when we stand strong together can we effectively confront the CCP to extreme new totalitarian system and the offense of the threat 
the CCP post to the existing international order. With this few remarks, I hope we leave today's event knowing this is a time to review uh, the appeasement and the engagement policy with China. And with the full knowledge that as a like-minded country, we need to stand together to ensure the CCP is a whole accountable for his expansion reason. Thank you for you joining us today. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for uh, telling the my essence. Thank you so much. Well, uh, Deputy Minister Cho, thank you very much for those uh, important remarks. And I appreciate you sharing your views on the role and importance of Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific, as well as the steps that, that Taiwan will take to strengthen its democracy and continue to try to uphold peace and stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait. We have 19 minutes left, and I wanted to uh, pose a few questions to you in, in those remaining 20 minutes. The first question that comes to mind is, um, thinking about how foreign policy from Beijing will change after the 20th Party Congress, especially in light of the tragic events that are ongoing in Afghanistan uh, right now. So I'd like to ask you, um, how do you see Beijing's tw uh, foreign policy changing after the 20th Party Congress, and especially in light of uh, developments in Afghanistan? Well, we can always hope for the best, but we should need to prepare for the worst. Uh, today, the China is a regime that does not uh, shy away from showing his ambition and the intention. This is evidence in the Xi July 1st speech, where he said that no one should underestimate the result the will and the ability of the Chinese people to defend their national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. Therefore, uh, I believe the CCP aggressive uh, foreign policy is unlikely to die down in the foreseeable future. We may even see a more assertive regime after the 20 party uh, Congress. Uh, over the past year, the CCP assertiveness and the intimidation have endangered the rule-based international order as well as the status quo of the regional peace. In face of such challenges, our government will continue to enhance our uh, self-defense capability to ensure and maintain the cultural status quo. In addition, uh, we will also work together with a like-minded country to Germany secure uh, peace and the stability of the region and beyond. Uh, for your question on the Afghanistan, uh, I have the same question for you. Do you think we should be worried? Uh, Taiwan is not and will not be another against Afghanistan. We are the force of good in the region. Uh, our destination to fortify our national sovereignty and the democratic system has never been so strong. Uh, we will never succumb the CCP intensified pressure and his separatory. Uh, Taiwan never surrender. Uh, Taiwan will continue strengthen and uh, proactive demonstrate our determination for self-defense. We will continue work with uh, work with the like country, ensure the peace and the stability of the, this region and beyond. Thank you so much. Uh, and I have to uh, talk about our Taiwan uh, irreplaceable, the, the, the strategic important. Uh, we trust the U.S. know that Taiwan is the principal strategic important that I, I have mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Cho. Um, I, undoubtedly, Beijing is going to try to 
um, uh, paint a narrative of a weakened U.S. resolve as well as a, a, a weakened Taiwan defense, but I, I think that's more propaganda than reality. Um, you mentioned Xi Jinping's July 1st speech. I wanted to ask if you could give your assessment of the speech and what implications you think the, the July 1st speech has. Thank you, your question. To understand the implication of the C July 1st speech, we need to put it under the right line. Uh, as I demonstrate my speech, the true nature of the CCP C regime is the dual extreme new totalitarian system, which is built upon the centralized leadership and the frantic nationalism, and the guide and the guide, guided by the internal suppression and the external aggression. The language is the uh, Xi July 1st speech overall ref reflects China's growing confidence and ambition, uh, warning those who dare to bully, oppress, or subjugate the China will find themselves on the collision course with the Great War of Steel, forged by the over 1.4 billion Chinese people. The interest enough, uh, we do find this statement iron ironic, since it's, uh, it has been the CCP who's proving and the suppression other like, like Taiwan. In addition, the C uh, strap, the CCP has uh, transformed the property, achieved their first centennial goals of the building a uh, moderately uh, prosperous society in all. Uh, respect, and now the Chinese national rejuvenation has become a historical inevitability. Uh, she also under, underlined the firm leadership of the CCP as the greatest trend of the Chinese government system, refers it as the foundation of life blood of the party and the country, the key upon which the interest and the well-being of the Chinese people depend. Uh, the, this demonstrates Xi's intention and the consolidate the legitimacy of the CCP ruled by strengthening his the centrality and made clear that the nation, his people, and the party cannot be separate. In addition, the speech also helped the Xi to pave the way for the his um, unprecedented certain in the 2022 uh, National Party Congress as he most directly adopted the title, uh, the Hesman Duoso, so. that's, that's used by Mao. Next, uh, turning to the meaning for the Taiwan, she devote the one paragraph at the end of the, his speech address the Taiwan issue, counterwise yeah. The speech did not reveal uh, a fundamental shift in the Beijing approach to Taiwan. Uh, mentioning the one China principle, peaceful unification, and the defeat any attempt toward the Taiwan independence and the all parts of the same old tune, played over and over throughout the year. Although the Xi referred the Taiwan issue as a uh, historical mission, he did not put a timeline on the complete completion of this sub submission, uh, such a mission, uh, showing that there, there is no urgency in the Xi policy agenda to resolve the Taiwan issue. However, she continued to link the Taiwan issue with the China national rejuvenation as the paramount leader of the June extreme new totalitarian regime. This remains a beseem how patient Xi Jinping is in making progress on the CCP historical mission and the extent to which he will turn the Taiwan into his legacy issue. Facing the CCP encroachment on our sovereignty and the security, I want to emphasize our see Taiwan is a sovereign state. Taiwan has never been and will never be a part of the PRC only the 23.5 million people of the Taiwan 
have a right to speak and to decide the Taiwan future and the development. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, following up, I wanted to ask about the state of discussions between uh, the Mainland Affairs Council, where, where you're deputy minister, and the Taiwan Affairs Office, the TAO, which is Beijing's official mechanism for, for dialogue and discussion uh, with Taiwan. Can you talk about the state of discussions and are there any areas of cooperation or expanded cooperation that both sides are now discussing? Thank you for your question. Uh, over the past five years, the CCP has uh, deliberately refused to interact with the uh, uh, President Chai and his government in front of the public eye. Beijing has uh, therefore uh, unilateral suspend official bilateral communication since the China insists that Taiwan must accept the political precondition. I want to talk about the China's Taiwan policy. Uh, simply put, the Taiwan China policy is rigid, negative, and without feasibility. They insist that Taiwan accept their so-called 1992 consensus, which they define as their one China principle. I want to point out that if we, if we accept the so-called 1992 consensus, it means we accept the China framework and process for unification with China. Therefore, we will not accept any political precondition because of the principle that Taiwan sovereignty and the democracy. In addition, uh, Xi Jinping remarked on the January 2nd in the 2019, known as the Xi Five Point. It's the fundamental principle guiding the China Taiwan policy. Actually, all these five points only refer to just one thing, which is to unify with Taiwan or oh, end Taiwan. She speed up his political agenda to unify with Taiwan as a nomad under the one country, two system model for Taiwan. Therefore, the cultural relation has entered the new era of the critical moment. She redefined the so-called 1982 consensus as the two sides of the Taiwan Strait belong to one China and should work together for national unification. She redefined leave no room for the Taiwan interpretation of the what one China means and the leave no room for the existence of the ROC Taiwan. Furthermore, she said that he would not renounce the use of force against Taiwan. Therefore, the so-called 1992 consensus is a path toward the unification with China. Going forward, both now and in the future, our government commitment to peaceful and, and stable cultural relations will remain unchanged. And we will maintain a non productive and a non adventurous attitude to prevent the Syrian conflict from the breaking out in the Taiwan Strait. However, I would like to, I would like to share the both sides of the Taiwan Strait share the common responsibility to ensure the peace and the security in this region. As the President Chai said, we hope that the other of the Taiwan Strait can take on the same responsibility to work with us to Germany stabilize the long-term development of the cultural relation. We are willing to facilitate meaningful dialogue under, under the principle of the parity and the dignity, as long as uh, the, the Beijing authority sincerely want to resolve the difference and uh, improve the cultural relation. President Chai has also stressed when the pandemic is under control, we look forward to gradual return of the regular, orderly, people-to-people -people exchange across the Taiwan Strait to improve the mutual understanding and uh, mis reduce the misunderstanding. We hope that Beijing can respond uh, uh, positively as a matter of corresponding uh, judgment. Although we all know the reality on the ground is far from optimistic, but under the present chat, 
Taiwan will be and uh, will continue be a responsible partner of the peace and the stability in the Taiwan Strait. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, shifting gears a bit, I wanted to talk about the U.S. and Taiwan. In June, um, uh, U.S. And, and Taiwan held the 11th Trade and Investment Framework Agreement. I wanted to ask how you think Beijing will respond if uh, Taipei and Washington sign a the BTA or a bilateral trade agreement. And as a follow-up question, um, how would Beijing respond if other countries were to follow the U.S. In, in starting their own trade talks with Taiwan, for example, Japan. Thank you, Joe Kretchen. Uh, as an export-oriented country, issue like the BTA is close to every Taiwan people heart. Uh, although the MEC is not the competent authority of the Taiwan economy and the trade policy, here uh, how I see it. Uh, consider Considering the nature of the sea, uh, the new totalitarian regime, the short answer is that Beijing will very proud to see the Taiwan US BTA and be hoping that knowing that the Japan or other country are thinking to jump on the bandwagon. China has always opposed any form bilateral economy and the trade agreement between the Taiwan and the other country. I'm sure that when get wind of the such development, Beijing authority will do everything in their power to block such the prospect by upholding the one China principle. Um, but make no, make no mistake, the RC Taiwan is a sovereign country and the separate customer, customer territory under WTO expanding economic activity and the negotiating trade agreement with the other country are our due rights. It's real not the CCP prayer to give its two cents. As an important player of the Indo-Pacific region and the responsible stakeholder of the international community, how, when, and with whom Taiwan chose to sign the BTA or FTA shall be on our own discretion. In the face of the US-China trade conflict, global supply chain realignment, and the challenge posed by the post-pandemic global economic recovery, the naturally Taiwan need to continue our diversification strategy to manage potential economies risk. Signing the BTA is definitely one of the options this government put on the table. This means to continue ongoing dialogue with the important trading partner, such as the US, Japan, and the EU to strengthen bilateral and multilateral economic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have uh, lots more questions, but I think we only have time for one final question before I have to let you go so you can go to bed. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, what is uh, Taipei's view of TSMC's operations in China? You mentioned in your remarks about the importance of semiconductors and semiconductor supply chains. How does Taipei view TSMC working in China and specifically the current discussions for a, a, an expansion of TSMC's fab in, in Nanjing. Uh, thank you, Ju. However, uh, Matt is not the main uh, competent authority of this matter. Uh, what I can provide you and our online audience can only be my uh, humble observation. Uh, we are fully aware that the U.S.-China trade dispute, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, the global chip shortage have all contributed to the worldwide recognition of the semiconductor as an important strategic asset. 
uh, since Taiwan is the home to world leading chip industry, uh, prevent our key technology and high tech personnel uh, from being infiltrated by the CCP rare supply chain. We always have been an important task to protect our industry uh, com competitiveness and ensure our economy security. We do careful review the each and every investment proposal with a high, high standard, making the comprehensive assessment on the possible Im impact of such project uh, on Taiwan on supply chain and the potential implication on the national security. The TSMC latest uh, proposal to expand the production at his the Nanjing Fab has a lot to do with the global chip shortage. Since after expansion, the Nanjing Fab step back behind the TSMC most advanced plan by at least the two generations, and it will not impact the TSMC paying capital in Taiwan. The plan was approval. Uh, approved by our government last month through the existing review the mechanism. Taiwan Authority Council have to carry out the comprehensive consideration uh, over the balance among the industry development, international competitiveness, protection of the IPIs, national security and the interest in the process of the decision making. Thank you so much. Great. Well, well um Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Cho. Thank you for your, your full and robust answers, as well as your important um, initial remarks. We are at, uh, at uh, the 47 minute mark, so I've gone two minutes late, but uh, very much appreciate your time uh, and insights. And I hope to see you again in person, uh, maybe in Washington, DC, but hopefully in, uh, in Taipei. So um, thank you. To you for joining and thank you to all the audience members uh, who, who watched. I uh, hope everyone has a very good day. Thank you so much. Due to the pandemic, we can only meet virtually. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we can have a more productive uh, discussion when we meet face to face in the new future. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I hope so. Uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Everyone in, in Asia have a have a great night. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.